for this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath but also said that God was his father making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show you him greater works than these that you may marvel. The Father loves the Son. It didn't say the Father loves the Apostle, the Prophet, the Evangelist, the Pastor, the Teacher. He loves the Son. We're all first sons of God. And He's wanting us to get a revelation of sonship. You know, Hebrews 4 talks about the rest of faith. It talks about the rest of faith. Labor to enter into that rest. There remains a rest for the people of God. Here's the rest I believe the Father is wanting the church to walk into. You know, if you weren't born again for some period of your life, which I can identify with because for 18 years I was not born again. I had rested in an identity as a sinner. And so my do followed my who. My identity dictated my lifestyle. My identity dictated, and I was resting in the lifestyle of my identity. I wasn't walking contrary. And so many Christians are trying to walk contrary to what's on the inside of them. And the reason they're trying to walk contrary is they haven't let the identity get rooted and grounded in them. The Father is wanting us to be rooted and grounded in Him, established in the faith, established in who we are, his word says that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. You know, so many times we want to turn this canon on the problems in our life. I'm talking about our faith. I'm talking about the power of God. We want to turn things on what's going on in my life. What can I affect externally? But God always starts on the inside. What did Jesus rebuke the Pharisees so badly for? They worked so hard on conforming themselves on the outside, but they never dealt with the inside. And what the Father is doing is He was wanting us to get so rooted in our new identity in Christ, in sonship, in knowing who we are, that we're simply living out of rest and not performance. It's so rooted in who we are. It's so become our lifestyle. It's so become our identity. It dictates what we say. It dictates our relationships. It dictates our priorities. It dictates our desires. It guides us. What does? The internal compass of who we are in Christ of understanding who we are in Christ of understanding our sonship. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. In the Greek, it says a new species of being, one that never existed before. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And many times we're waiting. We think that our salvation was kind of like a Band-Aid. It did so much to help us, you know, but when we die and we get to heaven, things will be better. We don't understand many times what Jesus did. In Colossians chapter two, it says, for in him, 
dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians 2.9. And you are complete in him. Did you hear that, church? You are complete in him. In him, you lack nothing. In him, you are accepted in the beloved. In him, you literally live and move and have your being. Listen to this, verse 10. In him, you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Now he talks about, we were circumcised with Christ. Now think about what this really means. You know, when a new baby is born and the parents decide to have that baby circumcised, let me ask you a question. Is circumcision a process or is it an event? And and is it a protracted event? (laughs) And the men said, let's pray, no, it's not. (laughs) No, it's, uh, it's not a process, amen? It's a one-time event. <laughs> it happens and it's over with, right? And um, what does he say right here? Colossians 2.10 or 2.11. In him you were also, you were, you were, you were. Church, you were circumcised. When? When were you circumcised? With the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism. You know, when Jesus received our wrath and our judgment for us on the cross, we were circumcised. When he died, our old nature. See, we got a lot of Christians walking around believing a lie that you have a sin nature. And that is absolutely not true. Your old nature, when Jesus died, your old carnal, sinful nature, it died with him. And when he was raised in newness of life, guess what? who also got raised in newness of life? We did. We have a new nature. We have the nature of God. We have been given a new, we're a new creature. We've got a new feature. That new feature is a new nature. And that na- what is that nature? We are partakers of the divine nature. How do we pe- partake of that divine nature? Second Peter chapter one, backing up a couple verses. He says, grace and peace are multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. One translation, the Amplified says, the full, the personal, the precise, and the correct knowledge of God. What is Holy Spirit doing? He is our tutor, he's our teacher, ever present with us, taking us into the holy written word of God, taking us into the word and showing us the treasures hidden in Christ. The Bible says, in whom are hidden all the treasures of virtue and knowledge. All the treasures are hidden in Christ, church. And so the Holy Spirit is taking us in to the promises of God. And every time you get a new promise, that promise has within it the innate power of God to bring itself to pass. The angel told Mary after she was told she was going to become supernaturally pregnant. The word word became flesh. The word conceived when she said, be it unto me according to thy word. But she asked the angel, how's this going to be? And one of the translations of the Bible says, no word of God shall be without power or of none effect. The word of God contains the power of God. And when you take the word and you begin to meditate on the word, The Bible says, Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinketh in his heart. We learned on Sunday morning that your heart has an electromagnetic field that extends 15 feet around you, at least in every direction. 
And I really think what they are, the scientists are measuring is what Peter was walking in. He had so saturated that kingdom, if you want to call it a kingdom radius around him with faith and belief and the power of God that when people came to his, into his presence, they begin to experience the manifestation of the kingdom of God. Wouldn't it be so awesome if you let the grace of God on the inside get so powerful and your heart becomes so consumed through meditating daily on the word of God in your identity that it so consumes you on the inside of who you are in Christ Jesus. And you get so transformed that it starts to affect everyone around you. And it is, and what scientists have understand is, begin to understand is they can hook up certain instruments to your heart and plot the graph and on a graph and realize they're measuring the transmission of your thoughts and emotions from your heart. And what they've realized is whatever your heart is 65% neuron cells, not muscle cells. So it has more neurons in it than it actually does muscle for blood pumping. And what they've realized is, is that whatever you meditate on in your heart is literally being released to every cell in your body, but it also is being released to everyone around you. So that when you walk into your work, when you're in the supermarket, have you noticed how people will just favor you? Have you noticed just people just want to favor you? They just want to bless you. And you didn't ask for it and you didn't perform to earn it. You haven't done anything and you're just standing there and somebody wants to give you the special deal. Somebody wants to bless you. They're like, this is the normal price, but you, you, I, I got to get you a different one. You know, is anybody know what I'm talking about? The favor of God. The favor of God. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 5 that he surrounds me with favor as a shield. When a man's ways please the Lord, he'll make even his enemies to be at peace with him. How does that happen? I believe part of it is somebody could be mad at me, but I walk into the room and I believe I've got favor with God and man. In Luke chapter two, even the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the Bible says he grew in wisdom and in favor with God and man. See, there's wisdom. Wisdom is tied with a short leash to favor. Wisdom and favor go hand in hand, don't they, church? And so you're meditating on the promises of God, not just quickly reading over the promises, but meditating, meditating to mutter, to ponder, to muse. The psalmist said, while I mused, the fire burned. What was he saying? While I was musing, meditating, fire was burning. How do you receive revelation from heaven? You begin to meditate on the word of God. You begin to meditate on the thoughts of God. How do you get the results of God? He said, well, my ways are not your ways and my thought are, thoughts are not your thoughts. But that was under the old covenant. Now, his thoughts are our thoughts. Why? Because we've been given the mind of the anointed Jesus and his anointing. We've been given a new mind. We've been given a new way to think. We've been given a new source and God is our source. We've been given a new supply to live out of the kingdom of God. It's a whole new way of life. And what the father is trying to do is he's trying to get us so rooted and grounded in this new way of living, this new way of thinking, this new way of responding to life get it so internally grounded in us that it just comes out of us. One person said it this way, when your bucket gets bumped, what comes out? Todd White says it this way, when a Christian gets squeezed, what should come out of a Christian? Love, love, faith. When circumstances try and lie to you and squeeze you, what should come out of you? The spirit of faith the spirit of faith. Glory to God. You believe the word over your circumstances. You believe the revealed knowledge of the word of God over your five physical senses. You see, we have a great advantage, church. We, we can walk through a storm and sleep in the storm. Why is that? Because the storm you can sleep through is the storm you can raise up and rebuke. It's the storm you have authority over. Why is that? Because the storm you can sleep through means that the promise of God is on the inside of you is bigger than the storm is on the outside. And the promise of God has gotten so big on the inside of you that you're like, oh, 
You're kind of like Smith Wigglesworth when he went to sleep one night and all of a sudden he was awakened because his bed was being lifted up and shaken. And he woke up and he looked around and it was the devil. And he said, oh, it's just you. And he turned over and went back to sleep. That's better than rebuking the devil. <laughs> That's, that, I mean, there's rebuking the devil right here. And then there's so knowing your authority and superiority to the fallen dark kingdom that you're at this level. And you're like, I, I don't even have to mess with that because I'm seated. I'm seated. Where am I seated? Far above all principality, all power, oh, glory, all might, all dominion, every name that can be named. Jesus was the first begotten, but we have been born again. We're after his image. We're after his likeness. And we've been given an inheritance, church, among them that are sanctified. We have been given an inheritance. And in Ephesians 1, Paul prays an anointed prayer that we would know what is the hope of his calling? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Do you realize that Jesus, everything he died for, his entire inheritance is in you and it's in me? It is you and it is me. That's the only thing he's gonna take out of this earth is you and I, that's his reward. But within us is an inheritance. Within us is a kingdom. And the church has gotten really good about knowing the gospel of salvation, how to get people to heaven. And we should be getting people to heaven. But at the same time, we need to learn how to bring heaven to earth. And Paul said, when I, when I came to you, I, I came not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but a dem in a demonstration of spirit and of power that your faith would not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. But then it goes on in the next verse and it says, how be it or however we speak wisdom among them that are mature. What is he saying there? When Paul went to an unchurched heathen nation that knew nothing about Jesus, he didn't go and try and rationally talk them into the gospel. Did he? Instead, he would demonstrate signs, wonders, and miracles. You know, Iris Ministries, Heidi Baker's ministry, they have a, a pattern where they fly into new areas and they present the gospel. They'll go into a vision, or I'm sorry, a village, and they say, bring me your blind and your deaf. And they'll begin to pray for them and see people healed of blindness and deafness. And that gathers the whole village. Everybody comes and then they preach the gospel and the, the village gets saved. By and large, the whole village gets saved most of the time. Why? Because they've never seen a God who's alive and real. And I'm telling you, every single person on this earth is looking for the demonstrated kingdom of God. Every single person is looking for people that know how to demonstrate the kingdom of God. Every single person is looking for it and they don't know they're looking for it. The drug addict is looking for it. The atheist is looking for it. The college professor is looking for it. The up and the up and outers are looking for it. The down and outers are looking for it. Every single people group is looking for the kingdom of God and they don't even know it. But when they see it and when they experience the kingdom, they they'll give it all. It's like the the treasure hidden in the field. When a man experiences the goodness of God, the kingdom of God, the power of God, the glory of God, they're like, I'm gonna sell it all and buy that field. I'll give it all. This is a time when God is wanting his church to understand covenant and love and devotion and to sell out, sell it all, sell it all out and buy the field and understand you don't need a safety net. You don't need plan B. You know, one of the things that they teach you in investing in the earthly world is diversification. 
And normally that, there's a lot of wisdom in that, I'm sure. But we are in a kingdom that's never had a down day. Let me remind you that Jesus started with 12 and now there's 2.2 billion of us. Let, re, let me remind you again, the 300,000 people are born a, a day. 1.2 million people are born again a day. Did you hear me? If things were to go straight line the way they are by 2032, the whole world would be evangelized. Now, obviously, you know, <laughs> we read our Bible that not everybody's gonna be reached, but you know what? I don't believe a, a wise farmer plants 80 acres of corn and only expects to take eight acres out of it. And I believe our father is the wisest farmer there is. He, the Bible says he's long suffering in James chapter five, waiting. What's he waiting for church? He's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. He's waiting for people. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants you to be equipped like Moses was. I love what Moses says in Psalms 103. It says about Moses commentating on his life and ministry compared to the children of Israel. He said, he made known his ways unto Moses his acts unto the children of Israel. By and large, there's a lot of people in the body of Christ that can look at what God does and go, wow, that's awesome, that's cool. And while, well, well we always, we should always maintain a respect and a an stand in awe of what God does, the other side of that is we should know how God does what he does. And part of knowing how he does what he does is knowing there is no formula. <laughs> because as soon as you think you've got it all figured out, you know, sometimes Jesus did, a, you know, raise the dead uh, one way. And I'm thinking about, you know, one time he put his hands on somebody's eyes and they were healed of blindness. Another time he spit in dirt and put stuck it in their eyes and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. There is no way to just say, Jesus did it this way every time. And that's why, while we understand faith and the principles of faith, he's not called us to just know principles. He's called us to walk with him intimately. And we combine an understanding of understanding the principles of faith and grace and Holy Spirit and kingdom. And we get these pillars in our life. We can flow with Holy Spirit and let the kingdom be demonstrated and let the kingdom be manifested. Because when Paul came to those who didn't know the gospel, he said, I came to you not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but a demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith would not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Many people backslide, many Christians backslide because their faith was in the wisdom of men and not in the power of God. They were preached an intellectual gospel, but they never experienced a real gospel, a real demonstration of God's kingdom and his love and his power. But I'm telling you, when you experience that which is real, you're ruined for the ordinary for life. You are ruined for the ordinary and you just can't do things like you've always done them. And you just can't live like you've always lived. Instead, you're like, Father, teach me. And that's why in the next verse he says, however, we speak wisdom among them that are mature. What is the wisdom he wants to teach us? He wants to teach us his ways. He wants to teach us not just to experience and see a miracle happen, but to know how to make miracles happen. Amen? That is our privilege as the sons of God. Our pr privilege is to look at earth and every earthly situation that we encounter and to realize anything that we encounter that doesn't look like heaven is illegal on the earth. It's illegally existing to the extent that we allow it. Because Jesus told us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
And that is an, that's a decree in the original language. Kingdom of God be. Kingdom of God come. Kingdom of God be released. Amen? So he's wanting to root us in our identity like never before. Father, I thank you for helping your church rise up in their identity. Lord, I thank you that on the inside of each one of us, you're working mightily. Father, we present our hearts to you, our minds to you, our bodies to you. Hallelujah. Father, we offer ourselves as living sacrifices to you. We offer 2014 to you, Father. Let it be the year, let it be a year where your church is built up and edified, walking in your power, your love, your glory, your peace, your presence. Father, release keys for each person. And he is, I see him right now. I see keys. <laughs> Angels are bringing keys. Different people in this room right now you have situations and there's angels delivering keys of the kingdom to you that will unlock your situations and unlock what the enemies tried to lock up and keep from you. So receive those keys right now. Father, we receive your keys right now. We receive your keys right now. Thank you, Father. <laughs> <laughs> thank you Lord thank you Lord for getting us rooted in the understanding that we're citizens of heaven we have dual citizenship we're citizens of earth and we're citizens of heaven a lot of us are citizens of the United States we can go to the capital city anytime we want in the United States and we can visit heaven in spirit, anytime, and access, Father, your presence, your glory, your kingdom, and everything has already been given to us. Your word says, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely, <laughs> freely, freely, Give us all things, all things. You're not holding anything back, Father. You said we're heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with the anointed Jesus and with his anointing. Some Christians are still held back by wrong teaching and wrong believing. And we're all growing in grace and knowledge and we will continue to grow in grace and knowledge. He wants us to understand our righteousness. You know, the two verses that just keep rolling around in my spirit over and over and over that are just bringing such freedom and peace. I think it's 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 1 John 2, 2. They release a revelation and an understanding that'll just turn your world upside down or right side up as it were. Can we put that in 2 Corinthians 5, 19? That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, how could God not impute the trespasses to the world, their trespasses? Can we put up 1 John 2, 2? Talking about Jesus and he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Do you understand what that says right there, church? 
It says that Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world. Wow. He's paid for their sins. All of them. All of yours, all of mine. He's paid for them. And that's why in 2 Corinthians 5, he could say he's not imputing them. Why is he not imputing them? Because they've been paid for. Does that mean that everybody goes to heaven? Now see, that's where a lot of people make a huge mistake. They jump off the boat into universalism. You know, unfortunately, hell will be full of people whose sins are forgiven. God will not violate the free will of man. He created us with a free will. He created us with the ability to choose to receive that forgiveness or not, to choose to receive that gift of eternal life, that gift of righteousness. He still lets us choose love. You cannot have true love in a controlled atmosphere. God doesn't make us love him. He gives us the privilege of loving him. (laughs) And what a privilege it is because nobody's ever loved you like he's loved you. Amen. Think about that. The next time you're in condemnation, the next time you feel like I just don't measure up, realize what God did in Christ. Realize the freedom that you have. Amen.